we can be open into the book of Ephesians, chapter number one. I'm sure Brother Larry understands this maybe more than others. But when you're a preacher and you don't get to preach every Sunday, you have a lot you want to say. Right. <laughs> so I think I, that's a warning. I thought of, about preaching on the magnificent Magnificence of Jehovah, I thought about preaching on the crucifixion of Christ, the, the great wickedness of sin. But I think last night I settled on this, our blessings that we have in Christ, or at least some of them. Amen. All right. We will uh, pray for my wife also. And for Aaron, he's continuing to heal up well. He goes back next Monday for his checkup, and we did get that checks and all that the church gave to us. So thank you for that. But Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 3. Here we see Paul writing to the church of Ephesus and he writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this Day you've blessed us with, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity we have together with thy people and worship thee today for the opportunity you've given me to proclaim thy word to thy people. I pray that you speak to us through thy word now, Lord. I thank you for the Sunday school message. I pray that we have that in class as well. That we give thee the glory and honor in everything that we do here. But we thank you for all the blessings that we have in Christ. Thank you especially for his sacrifice on the cross for us. I do pray for those that don't know the Savior today that if it would please thee, you might save one among us. Well, we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness towards us. Let's go with us now, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Well, as I was teaching at Calvary through the book of Romans, I don't remember exactly at which point, but I almost came overwhelmed with the amount that we receive through Christ, the amount that He has done on our behalf. Amen. So this is certainly not a comprehensive list that I'd like to go through today. Well, I do have quite a few scriptures that I'd like for us to just look at. We see here Paul says that He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We can mark it down that all spiritual blessings come to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're right. <coughs> One thing someone pointed out to me that these blessings are in heavenly places, so they can't be taken away from us. They're not, Amen. They're not here on earth where moss and rust is corrupt. <laughs> it's it. But blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So Paul goes on to mention how he chose us and predestinated us and how God adopted us. But I'd like to go to 2 Timothy to begin. 2 Timothy chapter 2, probably the most obvious, even though it's not wild, wildly or widely excuse me, accepted and quote unquote churches today. Second Timothy chapter two verse number ten. Paul writes, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. First we see that salvation is in Christ Jesus. That's it. Notice it's not in good works or baptisms or church membership. It can't be bought with money. Right. It seems to be, like I said, the most obvious of what I want to bring forth, but yet it's not widely taught today, is it? That's it. Most people teach that you have to be a quote unquote good person, you have to have enough good works, you have to. You get baptized, you have to join this church, you have to give this amount of money. Right. But salvation 
Biblical true salvation can only be found in the person of Christ. Amen. And as I know Brother Larry said many times, if you're trusting in anything else, I would check out what you have. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what most people want today is salvation and good works? That's it. Something they can do, something they can trust in, but really there's no other, nothing better to trust in than simply Christ and His finished work on the cross. What does Acts 4 tell us? Turn there real quick. I'll mess it up. I'll try to quote it. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 through 12. It says, Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ and Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you whole. I believe it was here. Peter and John had just been arrested because right. they had healed a person. Then it says in verse 11, This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which is become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name given, or under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Once again, we see salvation is in none other than the person of Christ. Amen. There is none other name given under heaven, he says, given among men whereby we must be saved. So it's not in Buddha, it's not in Allah, it's not in Muhammad. Amen. It's not in Brother Larry or Brother Junior or Brother right. Jared. But salvation is only in the person of Christ. And if you don't know Him as Savior today, that's all we can do is point you to Christ. He like said, don't trust in your own good works. Don't trust in... Don't even trust that your family was a good people. They were godly people. Hmm. The Jews said they had Abraham as their father, didn't they? That's it. What did Christ say to them? You are your father the devil. Amen. So yeah, while it may be certainly a good thing to have a godly family, there's no salvation in that. There's no redemptive power in that. Amen. You're right. You know, in my own family, on my mom's side, I have a very godly grandparents. That, well, my grandparents are very excited to be my Great grandparents over at Dobsonville Baptist. There's a lot of quote unquote Baptists on that side of the family. My other side of the family, if they went to church, they went to the Campbellites. Hmm. Yet neither one of those affects whether I should be saved or not. Right. Amen. Just like the Jews, just because they were of Abraham didn't mean they were. Of the real Israel, as Paul points out in Romans. Anyway, let's go on to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse number 24. We'll probably be going to, we'll be going to Romans several times. Paul brings out a lot of things that Christ has done for us in this book. Verse 23, we see that for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And he says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption as in Christ Jesus. Amen. First, we see we are all under sin. We are all <coughs> sin, and as it says here, come short of the glory of God. Not one of us were without sin, were we? Amen. And yet, and then He tells us that We've been justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That we have redemption in Christ. I mean, He has paid the price. He has redeemed us. Amen. Because we had sinned and come short of the glory of God, we owe the debt which we could not pay. And yet Christ redeemed us. Christ paid the debt for us. You know, as the songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. Amen. Amen. But yet we have many, many, many people today that aren't they trying to pay their debt with good works? That's it. So I pointed out instead of when I was at Calvary that no amount of good works could ever outweigh the bad works, could they? You're right. Amen. If you really want to be biblical about it, all the quote unquote good works are tainted by sin, so they're bad works anyway. Mm -hmm. In the sight of God at least. That's it. Yep. 
I don't know the number, probably millions, if not billions, of people today are trusting that when they get to heaven, they're good works without well, whether bad works. That God will accept them when they stand before. The, I don't know where they get Peter at the pearly gate from, but <laughs> <laughs> yet one day all of us stand before God and be judged by the works. One thing. Is what Amen. Revelation tells us. Well, even we must give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether it be good or evil. Well, if your name is being written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's what makes a difference. That's it. So here we see that Christ has paid this debt which we could not pay. He has redeemed us. He has justified us. As one person said, that makes us just as if we had never sinned in the sight of God. And because he has redeemed us. Our account is clean with God, if you will. Amen. Let's go over to Romans 6. Verse number 11. Let's go ahead and read verse 10 as well. It says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, died no more, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For in Christ we are alive unto God. In Christ we have life. According to Ephesians 2 and verse 1, we were dead and trespassed unto sin, weren't we? Amen. And God quickened us, he made us alive. This is through the person of Christ that He made us alive, that He gave us that spiritual life. Amen. You know, I've often heard and sometimes even used the phrase sin sick, but we weren't just sick with sin more. We were dead. Amen. Sin. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, we weren't limping around on some crutches. We were completely in the graveyard, mm -hmm. spiritually speaking, before Christ saved us. That's it. Let's go to John chapter 20. And the same thought. John 20, verse number 30 and 31. So right after Thomas had, had doubted, as we used to often say, and the Lord let him reach into his side and feel his hand. Then in verse 30 we have, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to have life. Not believe in ourselves, that's the modern thinking today, isn't it? Just believe in yourself. Mm hmm. That's it. Well, we got a lot, there's a lot of emphasis on self for some reason in our You're right. culture. Really, the emphasis should be on Christ and God. Amen. But then believing on Him that we might have life. Not having no good works that we might have life. None of the other things I mentioned. Once again, we must go back to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. I tried to kind of put these in somewhat of a Order <coughs> that we have life. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse number seventeen tells us: Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away; behold, all things are become new. Amen. He saved us, redeemed us, gave us life, and now we're a new creature in Christ. Well, he didn't just. Renew the old man, did he? He didn't just turn over a new leaf with the flesh. Mm. Rather, he created a new creature within us. Right. I believe it's Jeremiah and maybe Ezekiel as well tell us that he gave us a new heart and a new spirit. But in Christ, we have this new creature. And this new creature, this new man, if you will, John tells us, cannot sin. Amen. We didn't just 
hopefully save us and leave us in the flesh to continue on in sin. Certainly we have the, the flesh to deal with, and we'll see here in a minute. But He created us a new man in Christ, and this new man will serve God. As he man says. That's why I sometimes wonder about people who say they're saved and yet they never have any desire to serve God. Right. Maybe they've never been made a new creature or they're certainly far, far away from God. But here, we've been made a new creature in Christ, once again. Not in this flesh we were made a new creature, not. But simply in the person of Christ, He made us a new creature. All things are passed away, but all things become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So let's hold that thought on reconciliation and let's turn to Romans 5, verse 11. I know most people, at least my age, don't write, they don't balance their checkbooks anymore, but <laughs> I don't even think I have a checkbook anymore. All right, but I mean, used to when you balance your checkbook, but they didn't match with what the bank said anymore. You had to reconcile the two, you had to bring them back into agreement. Right. And that's exactly what God has done for us through Christ. Romans 5, verses 10 and 11 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we have also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. This atonement is, I looked up, the same as this, as being reconciled, restoration, if you will. But our, like I mentioned earlier, our account was in the negatives, if you will. And mm -hmm. yet God brought us in the person of Christ to a clean slate. He made us back in a, agreement with Him again. Certainly we were, as it says here, enemies of God. And when I think about that for a moment, how sobering a thought it is that we were the enemy of the very Almighty, of Jehovah, and the very one who spoke the world into existence, controls all things, and yet He described us in our natural state as the enemy of God. Right. That really ought to be a it's a terrible place to be, isn't it? Yet so is everyone who doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. The very one who opened the earth and swallowed up corn in his crew, destroyed the old world by the flood, who caused... Was it uh, Sapphire and Ananias to fall down dead to fossil feet? And yet, in our natural state, we were the enemy of God. He, even though yet we were enemies, Christ died for us and reconciled us to God, brought us back into agreement with God. Amen. Let's go back to verse 1 of the same chapter. What does it say here? Being, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once we have peace with God, that means we've been... We're at rest with God. We're no longer against God. We're no longer at war with Him, if you will. Mm -hmm. It means to be at one with. So not only were we enemies of God, He brought us back in agreement with God. He gave us perfect peace with God. And I think Paul in another verse describes it as peace that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. But many today don't have peace, do they? You're right. They fear the economy, they fear wars, they fear ISIS in the Middle East, they fear death. Yeah, for the child of God, we have, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's how to really trump any, any calamities that are going on in this world. I don't know if I can remember exactly how Brother Pink once said it, but he said that God is not surprised by anything that's going on in this world. That's it. Whether the economy crashes or whether it booms, God is not taken by surprise. Amen. 
really even Satan himself could not so much as touch the hair of him without the direct permission of God. Mm-hmm. So we have what cause do we have to worry as a child of God? You know, as Romans 8 31 says of God before us who can be against us. But spiritually we have this peace with God. So whether there's peace in the world, whether there's wars, rumors of wars, whether we're getting our heads chopped off by ISIS or whether we're right. living in prosperity here in America, none of these things should move us. For we are at peace with the Almighty. We are at, once again at one with Him. And did not Christ say, I and my Father are one, and then yet He has made us one with Christ? Amen. So really, we have no cause of worry or fear. For, we know the end of the story, don't we? In the end, we win. In the end, we have the victory. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Here, Paul also tells us what we are without Christ. Ephesians 2, verse, beginning in verse number 12. It says that at that excuse me that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What a terrible situation to be in, isn't it? Amen. That's exactly what our situation was before we were with Christ. You're right. So we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenant of promise. We had no hope. And we were without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes were far off and made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall, partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances for to make in himself a twain one man, so making peace. Now in Christ we've been made nigh unto God. Far before he says we were far off, we were strangers, we were without hope, we were completely without God in the world. Amen. Yet now in Christ we are made nigh. We're able to draw nigh unto God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did I think? I remember if it was James that wrote, "Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you." Amen. Just to think that we were without God, without hope, he says. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't, there's no hope in natural man. Is there? There's no hope of salvation. There's no hope of eternal life. There's no Amen. hope of eternal glory. We were really helpless, if you will, in and of ourselves. That's it. You know, I, one person said God just threw the life preserver out there and you had to stick your arm in it. <laughs> no, but the problem is we were dead at the bottom of the ocean, weren't we? That's Three. it. I can't remember, I think it was R.C. Sproul. I don't know, he wasn't the... Let me agree with him on a lot of things, but one thing he said that was right along those lines that God had to go down. And he didn't just throw the life preserver out and he had to stick your arm in. He said God came down to the depths of the ocean and drug us up Amen. and breathed life into us. That's it. Amen. So we were without God. We were without hope. We were strangers even. Yet in the person of Christ we were made nigh by His blood, he says. Oh, so much to praise God for in the person of Christ, isn't there? Amen. Let's go again to the book of Romans. Back to chapter 3 again. Romans 3, right where we were a minute ago, verses 21 through 23. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is, man- is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and all and upon all that believe. For there is no difference. For all of a sudden comes short of the glory of God. Right. 
when we saw we were in sin, completely, utterly unrighteous, yet now in Christ we have righteousness with God. But even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and unto all and upon all that believe. Will the scripture say of Abraham, he believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness? Amen. So it is for us that if we believe God, it shall be counted unto us for righteousness. So in, in the fact that we have righteousness with God, is one day we will stand before Him, right with Him, not in sin. We will really stand before Him without sin because we Amen. have the righteousness of Christ upon us. Unless that is we trust in our own righteousness. Paul said he desired that not to be the case for him. Philippians chapter 3. That. And for Christ to be our righteousness, he had to have a, a perfect righteousness, didn't he? And he wasn't just some good man or some prophet. Rather, he was the perfect Lamb of God without spot and without blemish. Amen. And that his righteousness was perfect, so he imparts perfect righteousness to the believer. What does Paul say here in Roman, or Philippians 3? He he lists there in verse 4 the things he can boast of in verse 5 and 6. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath where he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law of blameless. Paul had a lot, as he said, to the trust him in the flesh, didn't he? Right. You know, he was, in the eyes of his peers, a great man. You know, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was, a, as he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In the eyes of man, especially his fellow peers, he was a very, quote unquote, good person. Mm -hmm. Notice what he says in verse 7 but those things which were gained to me, those I kind of lost. For Christ. Amen. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I may be in Christ. And notice what he says here in the next verse. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul said he desired not to be found having his own righteousness. The righteousness which is through Christ. If all that stand before God trusting their own righteousness. Righteousness will too late, but they'll find out their righteousness wasn't good enough. Right. Amen. Well we ought to also not be careful of trusting our own righteousness. We ought to say as the as the uh, publican, God merciful to me a sinner. That's it. What did Paul say? But for the grace of God, I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Right. Another brother, I believe, if I remember the story correct, saw a criminal being led off to execution, and he said, "But for the grace of God, there go I." Yep. So we have no righteousness in and of ourselves to claim, do we? Even if we were a morally outstanding person. A, even if we gave all our tithes and gave charity and did all these things and all these good works, if we're trusting in the flesh and our own righteousness, we're trusting in the wrong thing. Yeah. But oh, Christ has given us righteousness through faith in Him. We can stand right before God. We can stand without sin before God. So completely righteous, not having broke the least of the laws in Christ. Amen. Oh, how we ought to thank God for that as well, shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as some teach that we must we must keep our own righteousness, that we must keep in our own good works. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have good works. 
when we stand before God, we'll be completely free. That sin will be completely right before Him in the person of Christ. Amen. Let's go back to Romans 8. Two places here at the end of the chapter, verse number 1. And the scripture says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we see here in Christ that we have no condemnation. And that is not even a future thing. He says, Now we have no condemnation. Mm -hmm. It's a condemnation and it's a judgment against it, it's a, a damnatory sentence against us. So in our flesh, we were all. I could say it's damned to hell, weren't we? It's a We were condemned to die, condemned, condemned to be eternally in a lake of fire. Yet now in the person of Christ we have no condemnation. There's not even there's a little bit of condemnation, no, there's none at all, he says. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's not something we must work to obtain to, it's not something we will hope we get. And one day he says, now we come to this. Was it the Midnights? I believe they have a hope yeah. of eternal life. To hope. Certainly we have hope in Christ, but we have much more than that, don't we? Amen. So in the person of Christ, we can have much assurance. Let's go out to the end of the chapter here. Romans 8, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Here we see we have the love of God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know uh, Brother Junior has been teaching, taught on it, and Brother Matthew mentioned it as well. But oh, how great is the love of God towards us, isn't it? Amen. Well, 1 John 4, 10 tells us, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. And sin is only begotten Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, so great is the love of God towards us that He sent His only Son to die for our sins, to be the, quote-unquote, eternal, satisfying sacrifice for our sins. Amen. And he says, in Christ also, nothing should be able to separate us from that love. No Satan can't come take it away from us. That's it. Situation, circumstance can't take it away from us. The government can't take it away from us. He says, nor any other creature, not even yet, we ourselves can take it away from us. That's it. Amen. Nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, nor death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. He doesn't leave out anything there, does he? That's it. Amen. Just a, just that point alone, I think, is a, enough praise him for the rest of our lives that we have the love of God in Christ and nothing shall be able to separate us from it. Certainly we were not deserving of the love of God. Certainly we were not worthy of the love of God. Like it says, He loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. That's it. Amen. Yeah. You know, I, I like that song entitled The Love of God, especially the one verse that says, well, if, how's it go? It says, if we could, if the, if the oceans could be <laughs> filled with ink and the, if the skies were the parts we made and every stalk on earth to fill and every man Described by trade would drain the ocean dry. Amen. The scroll cannot contain the holes those stretch from sky to sky. Amen. Really unfathomable is the love of God towards his people. And yet we possess that in the person of Christ, and nothing can separate us from him. Or if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you know nothing of this love you. It's it. Let's turn to Jude. I'm thinking on that same similar thought here. The very first verse of Jude. Jude 
Jude begins his epistle and says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called them. Amen. In the person of Christ, we're preserved. That goes along with what we just read about how the love of God cannot separate us. Now we, or how we cannot be separated from the love of God. Peter Jude says we're preserved in Christ. We're, so there's nothing that shall separate us from God. There's nothing that shall take away our salvation if we've truly been born again. But we are preserved in Christ forever. Really just as Christ lives then, because we are preserved in Him, just as He lives, we will live. Just as He shall never die, we Amen. shall die. Just as He is righteous and holy and eternal, we shall be righteous and holy and eternal in Him. Amen. This reminds me of what we see over in John chapter 10. I'm sure it's all familiar with verses with us. But John 10, verse 27 through 29. He says, My sheep hear my voice, verse 27, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen. And he says, I am the Father of one. First, if we're his sheep, he says, we... We know His voice and we follow Him. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the last, previous verse that He said that if you're not, we say you believe not because you're not of my sheep. You know, the goat never becomes a sheep. I found in Scripture. You're right. Amen. Well, what even greater than, or even that onto that, I guess you'd say that we're His sheep. He says no man shall pluck us out of His hand. He says that he gives us eternal life and we shall never perish. The last time I checked, never meant not ever, didn't it? It's it. Amen. Not that he gives us eternal life and then we might still perish one day. Not that he gives eternal life and it's up to us to keep it. But as we saw, we're preserved in Christ. Not preserved in our own doings, are we? Right. Isn't yeah. that, that's what the Campbell likes to teach, isn't it? Gina? You must preserve yourself. Hmm. Well, he says, No man shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man shall ever pluck them out of my Father's hand. The one person said that's double security, isn't it? Mm -hmm. From Christ's hand, and then again in the Father's hand. That's it. And no man shall pluck us out. Well, someone foolishly once said, well, No one can pluck you out, but you can jump out. <laughs> But they also don't understand the hand of God very well. That's it. I think uh, Isaiah chapter 48 describes the greatness of God. I can't remember exactly how the verse goes, but it describes just how great and massive the hand of God is. That's it. So if anyone ever never wanted to, for some odd reason, you, it would still be impossible for you to jump out of his hand. I don't know why any, as we're down to say, twice born Christian would ever want to be not saved. Right. But rather we have great assurance of it. Amen. We're preserved in Christ, we're kept in Christ, where no man can pluck us out, no man can separate us from God. And as Paul wrote in another place, he which began a good work in you will perform it on the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. okay, let's go a couple more places. First Timothy chapter one. First Timothy chapter one and verse number one. Here Paul begins his his epistle. Timothy, he says, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of our God and Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Here we see Christ is our hope. 
might say hope of what? It's Colossians 127, 127 tells us he's our hope of glory. Mm -hmm. you know, Titus 2 and verse 13 tells us looking for that glory, spirit, and blessed hope. Mm -hmm. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And Christ is our hope that he, our hope that he is coming again one day, that he is going to deliver us from this present evil world. Mm -hmm. Amen. But if in this life only we have hope, we're all in the most miserable fall world. And that's why I, one reason why I despise the, I don't know if you want to call it, picture of Christ still on the cross. Yeah. Or what's supposed to be Christ. Because mm -hmm. he didn't stay on the cross, did he? He wasn't defeated there. Amen. Amen. No, he was buried and he rose again the third day. I really believe that's, according to Romans 10, part of salvation, believing that he rose again the third day. Amen. It's really our, where all our hope lies in, isn't it? That he defeated death and he conquered death. Let's turn to Romans 7. Well, we're still on that thought. Romans 7. The end of the chapter, verses 24 and 25, where Paul has been describing the struggle between the old man, new man, the flesh, and the spiritual man. He said that when he would do good, he was present with them. He said that if, said, if then I do that which I would not, I can send them to them, the law that is good. Now, then there is no more I to do it, but sin dwelleth in me. The other part of the scripture, he says that. For I would, I do which I don't allow, and I don't do that which I would do. Right. And he comes to this conclusion at the end of the chapter. He says, "Oh wretched man that I am, Amen. who shall deliver me from the body of this death?" Well, like I mentioned earlier, we're a new creature in Christ, but we still have this flesh to continue with. Mm -hmm. We're truly trying to serve God. I'm sure, some of y'all know. It gets contrary, doesn't it? It gets Amen. in the way it's difficult to deal with. Yeah. And we often need to say, as Paul, oh wretched man that I am. He says, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But it was verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus Christ our Lord will deliver us from this body of death. Mm -hmm. One day we shall. We call it to meet him with, meet him forever, be with the Lord. And one day we shall be changed. Just we'll lay aside this old sinful body and put on a glorious body, fashioned like unto His. Amen. Let's go over to First Corinthians 15. Paul goes into more detail there on this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 57, tells us, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. For this corruptible must be on incorruption, and this mortal must be on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But one day this corruptible will put on incorruption, he says. One day this mortal shall put on immortality. And then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. We have the victory, as he says there, through the, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that means that death shall not defeat us, sin shall not defeat us, Satan shall not defeat us. Amen. Like I said earlier, we know the end of the book, don't we? We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't remember exactly where the scripture is. I think it's in Colossians. And find it real quick, I'll read it for us. I don't 
see it, but anyway, I know it. It's where it tells us that we shall be <coughs> chained and receive a glorious body fashion like unto his. Amen. He said, one day, because the person of the Lord Jesus Christ will drop this sinful flesh. That's it. One day we'll put on a body of perfect sinlessness and live forever with him. And he said over there to the Thessalonians that we shall yeah. then Christ shall rise first and we which are alive remain shall be called to meet them in there and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Completely free from sin and death and the effects of sin. So it's hard for this carnal mind to imagine a place completely free of sin and all its effects, isn't it? Yes. Amen. It won't be any more growing old, it won't be any pain and suffering. No, we won't need these eyeglasses anymore. Amen. No, Lord Larry, you and me won't have to worry about brain problems. That's it. Brother Junior, you won't have to worry about any of your physical problems you've got either. That's it. Amen. None of us will. None of the sin will be completely destroyed. There won't be any more that struggle that we read about in Romans 7. That's it. Amen. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's, once again, through the person of Christ. Let's go one more place and we'll close. Ephesians chapter 2 again. Verse number. Let's notice verse number 7, but we'll begin back and let's go ahead and just begin the beginning of the chapter here. He says, And you have to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among them also we all have had our conversation in times past, and the lust of, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who was rich Amen. in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, of pushing us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. That's it. Amen. So I won't go over it again, but we were dead, we were hopeless, we were wicked, but God. Amen. With his great love, showed mercy towards us and raised us from that dead state, pushing us together with Christ, he says. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. So even when it's all said and over with, the blessings that we receive will still be will still receive blessings to the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. It Amen. says here, he'll show the exceeding riches of his grace in the ages to come. So we have much to thank God for through the person of Christ, don't we? You're right. But even when this body is changed and we leave sin behind, it's not even done there yet, the Bible says. You know, I'll give you one more scripture to think on. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's it. But through the person of Christ, we can serve God fully, can't we? Serve him faithfully. But we receive much at the hand of God through the person of Christ. Amen. And that list certainly isn't a comprehensive list. There's so much more that He has done for us. So how we ought to thank God for these blessings, which I said we many times take for granted, many times don't think upon. But God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. You know, and if you're not, if you've never been born again, you know nothing of these blessings. Amen. And as I said at the beginning, I can only point you to Christ and Him's only way of salvation. Amen. Well, there you go. So.